We've all had stuff happen and some people have stuff still happening. That doesn't mean we can't learn to be totally responsible for what's happening inside us, what we put into us, what we do in the outer world and how we think our thoughts. We really do have a choice. You don't have a choice when you're overwhelmed and you're in an anxiety cycle because you can't even think clearly, but as soon, don't need to bring it down even that much to be able to start to see that you have choices and that you can make another decision. Bill Wilson, co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, wrote in 1952, If we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root some unhealthy dependence and its consequent demand. Wilson suggested that if we could identify and continually surrender these unrealistic and unrealizable demands, that we may then be able to accomplish what he imagined to be the recovery's next frontier, something he called emotional sobriety. Flash forward 70 years and join psychotherapists and best-selling authors Tom Rutledge and Dr. Alan Berger, who have taken up the mantle of exploring Bill Wilson's new frontier. Welcome to Emotional Sobriety. How are you guys doing? I'll ask you that before I introduce our wonderful guest today. Well, let's keep it short. I'm doing great. I've been heading out to the U.S. Open. I've been out there at least uh, three times in the last week, and I've just... I've had a, I'm exhausted and I've had a wonderful time. Excellent. Excellent. That's your, that's your thing, man. I love tennis. I love it. And in, in that environment, especially some of the early rounds that I saw, but even the semifinals I attended the other day, I'm just amazed at the incredible athleticism, talent, and the atmosphere in New York is just you know, unequaled, unequaled anywhere in the world. I mean, the other Grand Slams are great and wonderful, but they do not capture that new New York spirit. (laughs) That's great. Were you, were you ever a New Yorker, Alan? Did you ever live there? No, my mom grew up in the Bronx. So I feel like I'm, uh, I'm an honorary. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He, uh, she grew up in the, uh, the Italian neighborhood in the Bronx over on Fordham street. Well, I, I think your ancestry there shows when, when, when I, when I think about who you are to me, I, I think it does. And, and, and I know, and I know that that's for everybody I know who's, who has identified with growing up in the Bronx. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. And l- listen, I, I felt so great. I was able to maneuver the subway systems and go from the New Jersey transit into the New York subway and get out to the, I mean, I, I took t- a train and, an, and a subway to get to the, to the I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, I'm doing the Wayne and Garth. I'm not worthy. That, <laughs> that, that's, that's impressive to me. I, and I'm a, glad, I'm, I'm glad you know that. So that when I'm up there, you can just, I'll just well, follow next you. Year, I think we got a U.S. open trip coming. I think okay. we do. And I'm doing well. Um, I, uh, my girlfriend's moving in at the first of next month and it's a huge step I'm taking in uh, our relationship. And, um, you know, uh, I'm glad that we're, her and I are in a good place and chance to practice some emotional sobriety. And uh, Alan always tells me relationships are people growers. So I can expect a lot of growth, mm-hmm. I'm sure, in the months ahead. Uh, some stress uh, mm-hmm. as I adjust, but um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm feeling pretty good. Absolutely. Well, listen, guys, we, we have somebody that, that, that I've known for a little while, uh, and I've been on her podcast uh, some. Um, she is Gina Ryan, and she is uh, the host of this. And it's, it's let me sure I get it exactly right, Gina. Uh, uh, anxiety Coaches uh, Podcast, right? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yes. And it's like, it's, I mean, I, you know, you, I was just impressed when I first met you because, you know, I was had just fantasized about do, doing podcasts and you seem like the, the, you know, the, the overlord of all podcasts. I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I am in awe of, of what you've accomplished and, and what you produce on that. We'll talk about that as we go along. I've been, I've been looking back at, at some of your topics and listening to some of your, your things and remembering that one of the best reasons, if you have anxiety to listen to Gina's podcast on a regular basis is because her voice will make you calmer. She, she, it is, it is, the, it is the kindest most, I mean, it's not over the top. It's not, you know, it's, it's just, it just makes me feel better. I guess slows my heart rate down. Uh, uh, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. But one of the things I just want to say as, as an outset to, to, as we get going here is 
the you know we're, we're coming at this we've been working on this idea of the of the emotional sobriety that's something that bill wilson you know had uh, had written about a long time ago and uh and lots of different people have picked it up along the way but nobody has picked it up like alan berger has like a baton on a relay race and and uh and we have really has really been going going full full blast with his with his books about this and now about with our with our podcast and one of the things that when i th when i thought about you coming we were shifting back to having guests i thought you what i know about you is is you land on pretty much the same place as we land it's, it's like in terms of of and and one of the most important parts about that is personal responsibility you know we are so focused on that and you have such a kind gentle way of helping people to do that there's no you know i you know i when i was younger i used to think of that you know I, I was trained in how to get in people's faces and confront them about all kinds of stuff there's no reason for that it's, it's like the idea there's that's that's an ego driven way of doing therapy uh but so what we're doing, what we're doing is we're walking along beside people and helping them along to get to where they need to go. And I don't know of anybody who does it more, um, more effectively than you do with your, your podcast. So I'll shut up and let you talk about what you do a little bit. Oh, Tom, thank you. That was such a nice introduction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I appreciate our um, friendship, as you will, because mm -hmm. you uh, were a hit on my show. Like people really mm -hmm. enjoyed hearing you. And I haven't had you back because I don't do guests anymore. You're kind of mm -hmm. going to guests. Yeah, and, we're going that. So, we'll, I, so we'll meet over here from now on. Then. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but what I found when I, you know, had you on the show and was able to interact with you beyond books and emails and things like that was that felt like you were a brother, like that we had come from um, the same mother somehow, because yeah. although my angle doesn't come from uh, sobriety, so to speak, although we all need to be emotionally sobriety, sober, I love that whole thing, Alan, I love that you're doing this work. Um, but I spent many years in Al-Anon. I understand the language. Um, I understand a little tiny piece of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And the whole idea of when I was in Al-Anon, I remember thinking, why aren't we teaching this to the kids in school? Why didn't I learn this as a young adult or as a kid? It seemed like the 12 steps were just lessons in life. So um, so I very much get what you're doing and I love it. And it actually shows up in my work all the time. I'm sure if you listen to a show, you'll be like, oh, like what rooms does she come out of or something? Because I, that is what helped me and helped me to heal and move forward in my own life. So when I was counseling people for nutrition with eating disorders and all kinds of other things, that's, I pulled on all of that. That's just yeah. part of who I am. So that's why I think, um, I think we'll all get along. <laughs> I think we will. <laughs> I love what you said about just why aren't, why aren't we teaching this in schools? It's like, and I, and I saw you, I, I was looking at you, Alan, I was going, going, you were responding in the same way going, going like, yeah, it's yeah. Cause for the longest time I, you know, you and I've talked about that in the past. Alan, I'd go, i will go like, what do people do who aren't drunks? You know, how, how do they get this stuff? It's, it's like, and, and, and that's what, and of course, there's all kinds of ways that people do get it. You're talking about Al-Anon. We have in our the, the community we've, we've developed together. We have lots and lots and lots of Alan honors in, 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 in there. And it's, it's like, and they, they, they always bring such a, such a, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's depth to what we're talking about. Can I ask uh, what your relationship is with anxiety? today versus um in an earlier time before you had the podcast and uh you know before you started taking on this work because i'd imagine the work that you've done has really evolved you know your approach to it or the way that you metabolize it and um i bet there's a lot of lessons you know in that and what you've learned what a great question patrick because of course how do you get here so i was mm -hmm. uh anxious from about uh, actually um, 19 years old for about 20 years, I lived that anxiety cycle. I lived that uh, every day and mm -hmm. I would wake up and my adrenaline and cortisol would be flowing hard. And I would say, Oh no, here we go again. And it would just start the whole, so there goes the whole day. Right. Cause I just got it, got it all wound up. 
And so I, that was way back in the state, you know, that was the (laughs) seventies. So uh, when I started, so I didn't have um, the tools that are available today. I had um, to, I read, so my coming out of it was through reading philosophy and reading um, spiritual, spiritual books. It was uh, then later on going, going to Al-Anon, um, I, you know, my claw out of it was one little finger grab at a time to get me out of that uh, mm-hmm. um, wormhole. And um, so I just took it into the work I was doing at the time I was a nutritionist and I was seeing people. And then eventually I came to Maui and I was working with two different eating disorder centers and uh, all of my eating disordered clients would say to the therapists later in like um, would say to me when we were meeting um, would say the, they don't usually like the nutritionist. I don't know why they like you that they don't mind going to your sessions. What do you do? What's your magic? And I didn't know what it was uh, because the women would ask me, oh, what was your eating disorder? Because most people in eating disorder, their help have have struggled with it. And I said, I didn't, I didn't have an eating disorder. And bingo, one day the light went on and I said, I so relate to all these women, not through our eating disorders, but through our anxiety, because I had struggled they were just using food in their way of managing things, most of them. And I had just, just, I, le- I lived like raw anxiety. Um, so, but that's how I got to feel. That's where our common ground was. And that's why they enjoyed being with me because I understood them on a different level. Um, I you- just, I just need to say that that when you, I'm, I'm just sitting here laughing because because when they say I, I understand where the therapists are coming from because I've worked with eating disorders for so long, is is yeah, the people don't like the nutritionists. The, mm-hmm. the uh, it's it's like and and some sometimes I mean as always we have to shop around sometimes because the nutritionists <laughs> may not exactly ha- have all the skill sets that they they need to 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 sort of outwit somebody with an eating disorder. But it's like it's uh. uh because they're, I don't know why, but, but apparently only people, only people who are extremely intelligent get eating disorders. As far as I can tell, <laughs> they seem to be very smart. There's a, a, a woman named Jacqueline Small uh, from back in about around the time you probably wrote the book around the 70s. Sometimes she was living in Austin, Texas. Uh, 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 but she wrote a book called uh, How, uh, Being, Being Naturally Therapeutic. And it's like, you are natural. You are the reason that people connect to you beyond being a nutritionist. And then in any form that you're in is you are absolutely naturally therapeutic. It's, it's like, I think that, I, I mean, I would be, I don't know you all that well, but I would be surprised if we look back at your history and found that you have not always had that. I mean, it's, it's, you probably honed that honed the, the abilities and the skills and the talents as you've gone along, but it's like, there's just, you know, we've all known people who are like that. And you don't have to be that way to be in this business, but it's like some people just really are. And, uh, and th- there's no doubt in my mind, because it is rare that if somebody's got the job of, of you know, I mean, that's usually, usually I, I use them because I go like, okay, that's my bad cop to my good cop, yeah. you know, because yeah. they, they, they meet with the, the nutritionist and I go like, well, yeah, yeah, that's really horrible. But, but you know, <laughs> that you have to, but you have to do it. So let's see if we can work, work that through for you to be able to pull that balance off is, uh, is definitely a feather in your cap. Oh, thank you. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And I still hear from them also. So it's kind of interesting. What a ripple effect you have, Gina, with your podcast. I was like saying, it's like, you know, once they're out there, it's like you let go and, you know, and whoever, you know, but, but it's, it's, isn't it cool to know that you're, it's out there doing some good, man. You don't have no idea. And and you have no idea why And every now and then. And, and I promise you for every, every one of those that you hear back from, there's so many more that aren't writing to you that are being positively impacted by that. That is so amazing. Absolutely. And I'm sure that you are finding that with your show also, because I've, I've been listening and it's, it is another one of those like mine, it's evergreen. It's people can come back forever and listen to it. You're not talking about current events or something that only matters today Yes. Uh, or this year. I mean, this is about our, our soul. This is about living a good life. Um, and being able to actually yeah. 
you know, pick up these little tips and tools and make them work for you. You know, if the, what you find one doesn't work for you, don't take it, don't carry it yes. along. But, mm-hmm. but there's so much that you're offering through the podcast that people will come back forever and listen to yeah. it. Like it That's, doesn't have I had to some, ever go away. Yeah. I had somebody just yesterday that was um, coming back into therapy after being out for a while. And, and, uh, and, and she said, I'm, I'm going to need to go back and start uh, with your podcast from the beginning. And what I told her is I said, no, you don't you just, just, he said, just listen, just, it doesn't matter which one. You know, we've, we, the three of us have even had the conversation recently of like, like taking the numbers off of the l- listing as they come, because, because, it, you know, I mean, if you listen to us talk long enough, you know, we're not keeping up with, with what order this shit comes in. It's like, it's, it's, it's it, we're, we're, we're just, we're like, my, my cat is now messing with my microphone, my blue Yeti. It's like, uh, but uh, yeah, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They have that effect. It's, it, it, <laughs> Yeah, you guys can just keep it going. You don't, you don't mm-hmm. have to. I love that. That's what I tell people with mine too. They go, well, where's the first one? Because I have a bunch that aren't on there anymore. Or where's that first bunch? I said, oh, they're not there anymore. Just, just find the title that looks interesting to you and listen to that. Yeah. Right? And I have some people well, who listen to one show over and over and over, and then they will say, and then I got it. They said, I kept going back because I knew something made sense, but then they have an aha moment. So that's the beauty of the podcast. People can listen to you guys over that. and over. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. No, well, that so- means a lot coming from you too, because, because I know that you are, you, 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 you are quite, quite, uh, you've developed quite a mastery with this podcast art form. Well, you were part of my early days, Tom. So that's I'm so loving that. You, you know, I was going to say to you, Gina, that the, the the exciting thing I think that's happened in the field of psychology, and this happened a number of years, and it unfortunately didn't, just like in, in, in the recovery field, it didn't take hold. Gottman wrote this wonderful book, the fellow that's doing all the stuff on families or couples mm-hmm. right now, right? The Gottman Institute. But he wrote this book called um, The Heart of Parenting. And the whole book was about emotionally coaching your children oh. the whole book everything and it came out of he was interested in helping kids that were either bullied or that were incredibly shy and having a hell of a time adjusting the school for those two different experiences right so what he did was is he went in and he developed a way of interacting with the kids to help them understand the feelings that they were having and then learn how to better cope with them. Yeah. And one of the, the thrusts, and in, in it's exciting because I, I've seen other psychologists apply this too. A big thrust was helping the kids learn that what the other kids were doing and thinking was not personal. Right. It wasn't about them. I mean, which is, my God, what an important message you get early on. But the whole book was encouraging parents to adopt this style of, of parenting, what he called it, becoming the emotional coach. Yeah. So, and now I see that baton on that side of things picked up by Dan Siegel. Mm. Yes. Dan Siegel, you know, who's, uh, what was his mindset? I think was his first book that g- g- gained a lot of popularity, right? He's a neuroscientist from UCLA. He's a medical doctor and he does a lot of research on the brain and neuroplasticity and stuff like that. But what he did is he and this other, uh, I think a marriage and family counselor, they wrote their first book was Parenting from the Inside Out. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they talked to the parents and said, hey, you guys, if you're going to be a better parent, you better pay attention to how you were parented. Because in all likelihood, you're following the same programming. So that was the first thing, right? He got them challenged. Made them. The second book he came out with was called The Whole Brain Child. Oh, brilliant, that. brilliant book. And what he does is he takes neuropsychology and really boils it down in lay terms. And he teaches parents about the brain and brain development. And he teaches parents how to interact with their kids when they're in different brain states, Right. Like if they're upset and emotionally, you can't be logical with a kid. He calls it, the kid doesn't have access to their upstairs brain where all that logic, it takes place, right? In abstract thinking, they're in their downstairs brain. 
and the stairway up to the uh, upstairs brain is locked <laughs> until they get calmed down. So I love the way that he puts these things in, in, in accessible terms. So the good news is there are people trying to do this. Now, I'm hoping they do what you say, Gina, is bring this into the schools. And bring this into our educational experience, because I'll tell you, it really is the key to learning how to, to live a life that you can enjoy and feel good about and 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 not get overwhelmed with. Right. Not right. get buried by, you know, the kind yeah. of a thing. So I, I love overwhelm. That. It's yeah. that overwhelm that shuts the brain down. Right. So how do you. And if it's happening to adults, I work mostly with adults, but occasionally I will see a teenager. Um, but if it happens to adults and they don't understand what's going on, how can the kids understand? I mean, mm -hmm. they really need, uh, and they actually get it quite easily when they understand the difference between this is how you feel, it isn't what's actually happening and so forth and so on. But if we could teach that, I mean, they teach all kinds of other things in school that are not really, you know, useful. So why not a little <laughs> bit of something crazy. that could help them? It would help the teachers. It would help the whole school system, right? Really would. There's no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. To well, I'd love, to hear, I'd love to hear about your work and what you do to help people that are struggling with their anxiety. And Yeah. Yeah. It's So I'm a coach. I'm not a therapist. I always make that very clear. I don't do therapy. Most of my clients and many of the people that uh, listen to the show, they already have a therapist and maybe a psychiatrist also, and they have their own medical team. I'm just like the coach for, you know, when they're in a situation and something happens, you know, how we can actually tweak it a little bit. Maybe if we try this, or maybe if we try that. So the bottom line is to understand that we don't, you have to look outside ourselves. We actually have what we need already inside us and that we can begin to calm ourselves down. We don't, you know, I know everybody reaches, like Tom said, listen to the show. That's great. If I can help you calm down or fall asleep, that's awesome. But um, the reality is over time, you can do that for yourself. But it's by finding that own calm voice inside yourself because we all have that negative voice that is so loud. And uh, at least I know mine uh, was and is. Um, if we can begin to access those other, those other voices inside us that are calming, that are the ones we would use if we were talking to a friend to talk to ourselves like that too. Um, because like you were talking, the upstairs brain and the downstairs brain, I talk about it as the lizard brain, you know, and our, um, our you know, our adult or executive functioning brain. Uh, but once that lizard brain gets going, people get angry at it. They think, oh, my God, there's something wrong with me. You know, I'm, uh, but you're not. There's nothing wrong with you. It's a part of who you are. We all have this in our brain. And one can start to not beat ourselves up for a very natural response inside our brain, then we can start to understand it. And when we understand it, we can start to heal it. Um, but that's one of the things, Gina, when I listen to you, when I listen to your podcast, it's you do such a beautiful job of, of, of just, and for lack of better, maybe there's a better word, but normalizing what we're dealing with. It's not, there's no pathology in, in it. It's like, you know, it's, it's like, and that, and that really, that really coincides with the way, the way that, that we think about that, uh, Alan and Patrick and I think about it too, is it's like, you know, we're really talking about how to be a better human being. It's like, we're not, we're not trying, you know, it's not just, it's not like, Oh, it's something horribly, but you know, and, and I love what you just said about the fact that the, that the sabotaging negative voices are, and I, and I, I point this out frequently, or they just tend to be much less, louder and more persistent. Um, you know, they, you know, they don't, you don't, you don't ever have to go to the, to the mean message and say, love to get your thoughts. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's, they're always unsolicited. And what I tell people, and, and I think, and I think just now I thought you, you are, 
you are that unsolicited voice of wisdom in a way. Cause I, like I say, I love the way you, the way, the way you present on in your, on your uh, uh, podcast. And it's like, there's just, it is like this voice of wisdom that's there. It's assured. It's not pushy, you mm-hmm. know? And so, so can you talk, I was talk just a little bit about how you've developed your style of doing what you do on uh, during the, during the podcast. Cause, cause that's a, that's, that's an art form in itself that you, t- how long are each one of your podcasts? 30 minutes to keep between about 20 minutes, about 20. Okay. Minutes. Cause I mean, cause you, 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 you just, I don't know if you're working off script or not, but it's like, you're talking and it's like, it is, it, you, you just do such a beautiful job of that. How, tell me, talk about how you do that. Yeah, I, well, um, it's all of the emails that give me all the fodder for the show. So mm-hmm. I, you know, it's not like people go, Oh, how do you keep finding things to talk about? I said, it's endless. I mean, uh, everybody's got anxiety or anxious, stressful moments. There's always something. It's conversation. Happen. You're in conversation with your listeners. So that's what I'm trying to do. It's usually, yeah. um, or a group of emails that all have a single thread that I can kind of riff about. Mm-hmm. And so I try to present the the problem or the issue uh, or the email, if I'm reading it mm-hmm. in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the second part is where I'm trying to give some coaching, some life tips. Um, mm-hmm. I don't do anything different with my private clients than I do on the show. If you want free coaching and, and I'm talking about your problem, just listen to the show. You don't need to talk to me. Mm-hmm. It's all out there. It's, it's there. And uh, everybody can benefit by just listening. And so I spend a few minutes talking about the issue or, mm-hmm. and maybe sometimes Tom trying to uh, no- normalize it maybe a little bit because mm-hmm. people come to me, they think, like they think they're crazy. I like know. they're afraid they're gonna they're gonna step off the subway platform. They think, mm-hmm. I, you know, this is something wrong with me. And when you talk to them, they're just they're anxious. They have that part of their brain is just being so loud that we get in the cycle. And that's the difference between just coping with stress and anxiety and actually living with what is an anxious lifestyle, living with anxiety, panic Mm -hmm. is a cycle that people have trouble breaking. And so that's what I try to do on the show, help them find ways to break the, um, the cycle that might be coming. Well, you're very, you're you're very much, and again, you, you, this is something that reminds it could, that uh, connects us to, to to me to how we do this too, is you, you're, you're very practical in those, in those things. Mm You, 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 you use, you use very clear, simple language and you give them, you give them, you know, it's not just concepts. It's you give, you give them practices, you give them techniques. Well, that's what I wanted to do because there are lots of shows. If you want to understand the neurobiology of your brain, there are great podcasters out there that are in the science field that can really talk all about that. That's not my gig. I don't even like understand all that. Like I got my own understanding from my own personal experience Mm. and from being with people in a clinical setting for, you know, 20 some odd years. And I started to see the, there's a big root here and it's called being anxious, not being able to center and calm yourself so you can make the next decision. So um, mine is not based um, in the science and all of that. That's all well explained other places. But I think um, the people who listen to me are just looking for that, that what can I do? I don't need to understand the whole everything behind it. I just want to know how to get through the rest of the day. With, hmm. And then if you can get through the rest of the day, you can maybe make a better decision for tomorrow because you've hmm. calmed your brain down. You can actually access that upstairs brain as Alan was talking about. So that's well, what yeah. I try to do. A fundamental area of overlap that you pointed out between this and emotional sobriety is what you said about not needing to look outside yourself for the answer to your dilemma. Mm-hmm. And there's an appeal to that because it means that the ball is squarely in your court. It gives you, it's it, you're giving yourself a lot of power to overcome, you know, whether it's anxiety or issues of addiction, as we discussed. So 
maybe just talk about that. And with uh, power comes responsibility, right? So right. Well, I was going to say it's sort of bad. That's the bad news and the good news. <laughs> exactly. it's, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like you're, you could do this. It's like, Oh yeah. shit, I've got it. You know, but yes, you can't. Like, oh, whoopsie. You mean, I, you know, it's not my, my father's fault or my mother's fault. And yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I have to do this. Uh, yeah, it is good news and bad news because it does make you have to look at everything you're doing a little bit differently, right? Like I get to de- I get to decide and that means I'm responsible for the next the next step. And I find that people do well with that. They it looks scary on the outside, but once they really start getting the idea that what has happened to them is water under the bridge. I talk about that a lot. We've all had stuff happen. And some people have stuff still happening. That doesn't mean we can't learn to be totally responsible for what's happening inside us, what we put into us, what we do in the outer world, and how we think our thoughts. We really do have a choice. You don't have a choice when you're overwhelmed and you're in an anxiety cycle because you can't even think clearly, but as soon, don't need to bring it down even that much to be able to start to see that you have choices and that you can make another decision. So I think that's part of that responsibility and that power, as Patrick said, power in, I get to, I get to choose here. It may not be a comfortable choice, may not be easy. And that's one of the biggest things I talk about is that discomfort is not dangerous. Like, of course, it may be dangerous. We can take these statements, you know, to the extreme. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. for generally speaking, you have it. If you're listening to me on the show, I say, if you're listening to me, you're okay. Like you wouldn't be listening Mm -hmm. to me if you were in an emergency. So Mm -hmm. if you're listening to me, you're okay. So your discomfort right now is probably not dangerous. And just that can just start to bring people down a little bit. Like, oh, maybe I can take a breath. Maybe I can think about this differently. Alan, you can hear, you can hear in what she's saying that, I mean, the, the commonalities, one of the things that she's all, she's doing exactly what I hear you do with, when you're working with people is, is you bring, you always bringing them back to the present moment right now it's like because of course what does anxiety do anxiety you know is, is you know it, it, we and all of, we all have our own personal ang- anxious monsters in there but it's like it's like they're you know they're very often the prophets you know they're they're giving they're predicting all the things that you know can go wrong and it's like you know and it's and that's not in the present tense and so you know and i've heard i've heard you do that in the uh in in, in your podcast that the, some of the episodes i've listened to is 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 yeah you just br- you keep bringing it back to the present and yeah. keep and and the other thing is you 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 credibly reassure so yeah, yeah, reassurance you always say like food food is to hunger as as reassurance is to fear and it's like but the truth is we reassure we often reassure people with good intentions but we really are criticizing we're saying oh you shouldn't feel that you shouldn't you shouldn't fear that it, or it's not that bad it's like what you're saying what you're saying is you're giving them credible reassurance you're mm-hmm. you're not you're not denying their reality which is whatever you're anxious about is what you're anxious about that your anxiety is a reality and look at the other thing too, Gina, that I, I am, I, I so agree with you on is, see, I think that there's this idea that when we develop, especially in our culture, that we shouldn't ever be that uncomfortable. Mm, yeah. There's this whole phobia against discomfort. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's really a prejudice, isn't it? I mean, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want it in my life. If it's in my life, something's wrong. And see that relationship we have to it, because, you know, a neat way of thinking about emotional sobriety is thinking about that emotional sobriety is about relationship. What kind of relationship do I have with my emotions? Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship do I have with my anxiety? What type of relationship do I have with my discomfort? And I love what you say. My God, you know, if you if you don't befriend your discomfort, you're in for a real tough road. Because part of the human experience is to be uncomfortable at times. Absolutely. And I think this may just be me getting older, but it seems like it's getting worse because I see young people are are truly in an anxious state over very small discomforts now. And, 
And the whole medical piece has also gotten bigger. Um, uh, medical anxiety or health anxiety is like, what? it's like out of control. Every little thing has is projected as ang- anxiety mm-hmm, will mm-hmm. do into the future, but they actually are, it's also being fed through the medical community too. So they try to get a little bit of help and often they're just taken down the road of, of bigger and scarier things. So I see why um, this is blossoming in them. They're getting a little bit of help sometimes. Whereas maybe, you know, I grew up in the day, I would call Dr. Tulloch, our uh, family doctor in Skinny Atlas, New York. And I would say, Mm -hmm. oh my goodness, you know, the kids, you know, so-and-so has this or that. And he'd say, you know, he'd run it. He would actually talk to you on the phone. That was a long time ago. (laughs) And he would say to me, you know, he'd run it through his doctor mind and he'd say, well, you know, Gina, why don't you give me a call in 24 hours? Let's see. Like there was always this, let's wait and see. And I have to tell you, I don't think we ever called back with the issue, (laughs) ever. Like it resolved so many small Mm -hmm. things. If we would just give ourselves a moment to calm down. I always say time is such a beautiful healer. Give ourselves that little bit of space, a little bit of time. And maybe we can either see it differently. Sometimes we completely forget about it, which is interesting. Or if it is a big issue, if you are in danger, you are, your body will let you know, it will, you will have to go for help. You won't miss it. Believe me, I have friends who've had heart attacks. They said, you will not miss it, Gina. (laughs) Well, the the other thing is that that one of the things that that I think I wrote about in in embracing fear was that that sometimes the, 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 the simplest things are the most reassuring and, and, and your doctor, uh, actually did one of those, which is, which is very reassuring. And it's about, it's about not isolate, not, not feeling alone. It's, it's, he's basically with the way he, by say, call me back in 24 hours is it's, I'm right here. Yeah. You're not, you know, I'm I am right here. And it's like, Oh man, if so, just somebody knowing, just, uh, just knowing, we know that as, as recovering uh, addicts, the, th- the, th- the three of us, but, but it's, but, but we don't have a corner. On, and that's what the more we've done this. I've learned, we don't have a corner on that market. It's like just knowing that you're not alone and that there's, that there's somebody that, that knows and that cares yeah. makes a, makes a big difference, giant difference. Somebody that gets it, like they get you, because yes. oftentimes a family member won't get it, you know, like that's okay. But if that's what I think, that's why I think the show is so popular. People feel that I get them, like I get it. They know they can. That's a, I mean, Alan, can you count, possibly count the number of times you've had clients say, you get it. It's like, yeah. that's, that's one of the things I've heard throughout. It makes me very happy. And I'm not saying I get everything. I'm sure there's some things that I've missed and other, uh, other therapists have gotten it and, and they, and, and, you know, they should be with those folks, but it's like, it's like, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And we're, that's what we're, we're not trying to, to, um, to sort of upload our knowledge into them. We're trying, first thing we do is, is, I mean, this is such a, such a big part and this isn't any different from being a coach or being a, being a, a, a therapist. It's like, we listen. Yeah. Yeah. And that, cause it, 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 that's how you've learned everything that you know about this. Mm-hmm. That's right. No, a, a, an anecdote that kind of reinforces what you just said, Gina. So my son, Nick is, uh, was quite an athlete when he was a kid. And he started to develop some obsessive compulsive behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so he had to count to four before he could do anything. And if he was hitting, uh, he was a soccer player and a tennis player, he had to always uh, have his last touch with the soccer ball on his left foot. Mm -hmm. Right. So he started to develop these rituals. Mm -hmm. Um, He couldn't walk on cracks. If if he had to drink, he had to drink in sips of four. So the number four was really much, you know, a big part of it. And for most of the, of his, you know, you know, experience as a junior, he was, he was managing it. Okay. And then, you know, at some point it started to get a point where it seemed to be interference. So he said, well, would you like to talk to someone about it? He says, yeah, I'd love to. So we hooked him up with this therapist and she just happened to be a wonderful therapist. She was very good with kids. He was about 
maybe 11 years old, 10 years old at this time, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes in and he meets her for the first time and she goes through all of this stuff and tries to understand when these things happen, what happens, what he's feeling. And he was very forthcoming with all the experiences he had. He goes back for his second session with her. She says, well, listen, I've really understood a lot of what you said and I understand how terribly you know, uncomfortable this is for you at times and stuff like this. But, but I want to focus on a few questions for you. She goes, let's say you didn't touch that soccer ball with your left foot. What would happen? Well, he went, I'd be terribly uncomfortable. She goes, you'd be really uncomfortable, wouldn't you? How uncomfortable would you be? And he talked about how, he says, but you wouldn't die from that discomfort, would you? And he said, no. She goes, so what you're learning is that you don't have to do these things. You always have a choice between doing them or not doing them and just being uncomfortable for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like his world opened up. Yeah. It was unbelievable when he was an adult because he played division one tennis. When he was an adult, he says, dad, it was amazing what that did for me. It's not like it took my anxiety away, but it empowered me in such a way that I always had a choice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I, let's say, go to eat that fourth M&M, I wouldn't eat it and I would just feel the discomfort. And he says that was empowering, that I was, I was in control yeah. of what was going on. Just that little shift. I mean, it's amazing how much of an impact that had on him. And I really think it prevented him from having a full-blown anxiety disorder later on in life. Yeah. And so wonderful that she was able to just clue right in with him and to feel, hear him and be able to do that with him. Because so often people, you know, they get labeled. And so they think there's something wrong with them. They have this thing. Yeah. And instead mm -hmm. of, you know, understanding that what your son was doing was he had particular behaviors. He didn't have a thing. He just yeah. was acting out some behaviors mm -hmm. because he was anxious. Yes. Right. So and we're all anxious and we all do different things yeah. with it. And so she knew exactly how to help him uh, to, to steer it differently. Look at it differently. That's, that's the key, isn't it? She did not label him and tell him he had a disorder. Right. She, she says, you have a challenge and yeah. this is, you can meet it and you have a choice. I mean, I thought it was so brilliant how she moved him into that position where he could choose. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, really was. Well, and the, 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 just look at that. The other thing that that has in common with all the other stuff we're talking about is not, not one of us is ever telling somebody we're going to help them get rid of something. That's right. You know, you, we're not going to, you know, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I tell I, them. I'm, I have permission to say this from Nick. I'm not breaking uh, okay. Okay. He has given me. He said, "Dad, if you could share it with anybody, if it helps someone, please go ahead and share it." So cool. I'm I'm cool. not breaking his confidence. No, that's no, that's it's uh, it's uh, well, tell him it is helping because that's because that's a good story and that's mm -hmm. you know and and it's just and and you know it's, and, I, and I can't remember which one of you were you used the word last, but but the word is choice. Instead of trying to get rid of something, we're always we're always empowering people with choice. It's like it's like you have a you have a choice and. Uh, uh, that that gives us the you know the power that is you know I, you know my 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 way of semantically distinguishing these two things is i'm not in control of a lot of things but i'm in charge you know and that's what everything when coming back to the present tense when you're talking about that gene is what you're telling people is you're in charge you get to you know and i think the, the piece that i've gotten clearer with emotional sobriety and and it's absolutely coming out with what you're what you're saying today, Gina, is this idea that I've always known I've always fully got or for a long time, I've fully gotten the idea that, we, that I, it's, I always have choice about how I how I choose to, to respond or behave interpersonally. But we're talking about the intrapersonal part. We're talking about I have the power to change how I interpret what happens to me. And that's that's real power. That's yeah. huge. Because yeah. again, that's that you don't need it from outside of you. Yeah. You can just decide, 
I get to choose how am I going to take this personally? Right. Or, right. And that's it. When you tell the story about Nick, that's the, the moment in time, whether he has those words to describe it at that time, that's what he's got. He, he's, he's got, I, you know, I, I, I get, I'm in charge. My choice. So Jeannie, is there, is there an anecdote you have from your practice? Of course, understanding, you know, everything's confidential, but can you describe a situation that you felt very touched by that you helped somebody struggle with and, and still protect their identity enough that you could talk about it? Yeah. Well, let me think. I guess I didn't know I would, would need to come up with one of these. Let's see. I didn't um, know either until just yeah. <laughs> to ask you that. This is a great question because actually mm-hmm. my life is touched daily by my people who not only some people that I work one-on-one with because I'm they're actually doing less and less of that, but the people, they will write to me an email that something that a show said to them, how they received it has made these huge differences in their lives. And they actually bring tears to my eyes. Um, Mm -hmm. People have changed relationships like with, like in a marriage situation where they, a lot of times I get this from women a lot. And so I'll kind of group these people together instead of one person Mm -hmm. that I married the wrong person. I shouldn't have married him. And it becomes this anxious loop. Um, You know, one day you have a doubt. I mean, I was married for 26 years. I know that sometimes you look and you go, oh, you know, everybody has a doubt. Did I marry the right person or am I, did I do something? But they, but then it builds up because of something else in your life. You're overwhelmed, you're tired, you're hungry, anything. And it just grabs you and it becomes that endless loop. So they're thinking they're in the wrong situation and then they get nervous and that feeds the the voice gets louder, which makes more adrenaline flowing and they feel worse. And they will write and talk to me about how they took what I said and looked at their reaction to what what the feelings they were having, not the situation didn't change, but they were looking at their own reaction to what was happening. And they were able to see things differently. They saw what they were doing was in a different light and the way that their mate was actually responding to them. So it really warms my heart with the relationship ones because they're beautiful relationships, all of them. The ones that wrote about it were about having a good, decent, solid relationship. But the anxiety monster in there, as Tom would call it, Mm -hmm. has just bitten them in a way that it's infected everything they're looking at. So what they got from me was to just look at it differently, to slow things down, look at it differently, and not continue in that loop, which is physical and mental, that's why it's it's so interesting because it's not just our thoughts. It's our body reacting to our mm-hmm. thoughts too. And it just keeps going. So those are, those have always made me feel just wonderful that they resolved it. They send me then, they send me pictures of the baby. And one of them was not quite married yet. She was wondering, should I get married? So, you know, then I get the marriage invitation, the pictures of the baby, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. life was good, but they but they were so sure it was the wrong person, right? Can you give those folks out there that are listening that struggle with their anxiety one or two tips that might be able to help them? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I want them to, I hope you guys that are listening can know that what you're feeling is not abnormal. All of us here that I'm looking on this screen with the Mm -hmm. Zoom, we have all experience that feeling that you might be having that mm-hmm. dreaded pit in your stomach, the nervousness, the sweatiness, whatever it is that comes up, we all have our own personal uh, recipe for our, how anxiety feels to us. Just know it's not abnormal. And this is part of the human experience. That's the first piece is you are not alone where this is part of the common humanity. So there's nothing wrong with you, particularly because of that. Unfortunately, we can't just diagnose it, give you a pill and it will go away because no matter what pills you take, it's still, you're still going to feel it because it's part of your human experience. 
And the other thing is, is that you can live with this long enough to be able to bring it down a few notches. This is what we want to do. If you're feeling overwhelmed, you can be with that discomfort like we were talking about earlier, just long enough. And I have to say, I have to bring the breath into it. One of the best ways to do that is to use your body. When your mind is taking you places in the future, it's taking you to out of control places, use your body to bring you back to the present moment and to slow down those stress hormones from releasing. And we can do that by simply extending your exhale. You don't need to count numbers. You don't need to pay attention to the inhale. The inhale will take care of itself. Just have a longer, slower exhale for while you're thinking about it. Do it three times, do it 10 times, whatever you can do. Longer, slower exhale will send a message to your brain that all is well. The amygdala can stand down and it'll give you a chance to catch your breath, so to speak, and be able to reconnect with your whole brain instead of just living in your amygdala. Yeah. I am a fan of, I'm a fan of simplifying when that's possible. And that's a beautiful, powerful simplification. That is beautiful. I will, I will, I will, I am going to put that into use in my life. I'm, I am, I am currently memorizing that. Absolutely. Thank well, you. I, I use it, it all the time. No, <laughs> it's, it's great because it really does simplify that whole breathing cycle mm -hmm. that we want people to go through. But you're right. If you just pay attention to your exhalation, the inhalation will take care of itself. You know, it's it's funny to one of the things that we talk a lot about self-support and mm -hmm. it's very interesting how breathing is such an important part of that. And I don't think it's mm -hmm. it's coincidental because our first act of being differentiated and supporting ourselves was breathing. Yeah. When we were born, we had to support our own oxygen mm -hmm. intake from the environment. Mother was no longer going to do it. The umbilical cord mm -hmm. gets cut. What's our first responsibility to breathe? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, it's I think uncomfortable. It, it, of course, because we didn't know how to do it. We never done it, first of all. And now we're doing it. But I'll tell you, it's there's something I think that's that's what makes that such an empowering intervention, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we did when we were born to take care of ourselves. Now that was a it was a body memory. It couldn't be a verbal memory because we didn't have the verbal abilities of developed mm -hmm. yet. But that's how deep that grounding is. Mm, so I love it. I just love it. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I love meeting with all of you. It was so wonderful well, to meet you. And we'll make sure that we put the information for your show and uh, your practice in the show notes so that the audience can uh, get in touch if they need yeah, to. Yeah, and, and I just want to recommend people people to, to eat, whether you characterize yourself as, as, you know, suffering with anxiety or having anxiety or not. It's like, this is it's what Tina says it's about it being a human being. It's like, I really recommend anybody listening to us uh, who connects to any piece of what we're saying is, is to go, go try, 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 out try some gina uh listen listen to, to that and what i think I, I can't remember if i said it on the air or before we started but one of my favorite things about listening to your your podcast is just i love listening to your voice it's mm -hmm. it's it calms me so Aww, thank you mm -hmm. thank you i'm glad i can do something to make the world just a little calmer tinge your life tinge your myth cultivate your narrative with whomever you're with then with glass in hand and children on one knee Bring some stories, bring your stories back to me It ain't a crime to be a human Never be ashamed to be yourself Rest assured that whatever you're doing Will entertain me like nobody else so here's to us, my old friends Until it's time to drink the wine and break the bread again With glass in hand and children on one knee Bring some stories, bring your stories back to me